a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. We're going to be talking about international treaties and particularly the pandemic treaty at the World Health Assembly. Uh, which has only just uh, been completed. Of course, the, uh, there's been a bit of an impasse, so there hasn't been any vote on it. But uh, you might have been following those developments in Geneva, in Switzerland. Uh, towards the end of May, uh, there was a push for an international agreement on a global pandemic treaty. And well-known freedom advocate George Christensen, he's just back from Geneva where he was one of the voices in opposition to a global treaty. The pandemic treaty is seen by many to be a globalist push for control of national health policy and individual health decisions. The pandemic treaty has been postponed. It did hit an impasse at the World Health Assembly, where the WHO's member nations, including Australia, met to determine whether or not it would give a green light. But now it's been pushed to a vote planned for next year, 2025. George Christensen is our guest this coming hour. He's served three terms in the Australian Parliament with the LNP. He's been Australian Campaigns Director for Citizen Go. And he was founder of the organisation Nation First. And he was recently elected councillor of the Mackay Regional Council. Uh, George, a special welcome back to 2020. Well, thank you very much, Neil. It's great to be back on your show. George, you're only just back from Geneva. Um, Describe for us the process. Uh, Paint a picture for listeners so they know what was going on there and uh, what was so necessary about you getting on a plane and actually going and uh, advocating against this particular treaty. Yeah, thanks, Neil. So what happened, uh, uh, I've been back a week now from Geneva and uh, the uh, days preceding me being there, the World Health Assembly was gathering in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, um, and that is uh, member organisations, as in countries uh, and their delegates from all over the world who signed up to the uh, the World Health Organisation, uh, gathered to vote on a range of measures that uh, the executive uh, of the World Health Organisation had put to them about a new way forward. One of those things was called uh, colloquially the Pandemic Treaty. I think its full title is something much longer, Neil. uh, They call it the Pandemic Instrument, uh, but it's also known as the the, um, Pandemic Preparedness Prevention and Response Accord. Uh, This document, um, thankfully, was not passed. And... um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, some of the reasons that may, may that countries had in not passing it may have been different to uh, the reasons that uh, that I have and that Citizen Go has, and that perhaps many of your listeners uh, uh, might have against the pandemic treaty. Nonetheless, it was important to be there uh, for for uh, just to send a message to all of these delegates. And boy, did we send the message! I can talk about that a bit later, but uh, it was important to send a message. We had people from all over the world, from the United States, uh, from Africa, from all over Europe, from Latin America uh, that were there. And then along with that, there was a huge protest on the Saturday where people from uh, pretty much all over Europe, particularly from the UK, France, they uh, came in droves to protest and You know, that's highly unusual, actually. You don't see these protests so much out the front of the United Nations. Uh, You see small gatherings, but this was like a a full-blown march and demonstration uh, from the peoples of the world uh, against this proposal that was happening there. I know that there'll be some who will be thinking, what's so sinister about Mm. this health treaty? Because, you know, having gone through COVID... Uh, Some will be saying, of course, this is where you'd expect the World Health Organization to be going to, uh, to be thinking about some level of international preparation and coordinated effort uh, to prepare to uh, to be able to resist any uh, new big threats to humanity. Um, What is it that's so sinister about a globalized idea of having a treaty and being prepared? Yeah, look, uh, well, uh, there's two things. Uh, One, quite clearly, the proposal as it was originally put forward, and who knows what it'll end up now, 
uh, with another year of negotiations around ratifying it. But the proposal, as it was originally proposed, uh, was one that would uh, undermine national sovereignty and also undermine uh, personal freedoms, particularly in the space of personal health choices now. And, and look, I, I don't think that uh, for anyone that either of those things uh, are something that you would tolerate from uh, a globalist organisation that's not elected by anyone, quite frankly. Um, now, how did it do that? Well, uh, one of the things that was in here was the ability of pandemic emergencies or public health emergencies to be unilaterally declared by the Director General of the World Health Organization, um, with him personally appointing a committee of experts that'll, you know, oversee what will go on uh, within nations after that emergency is declared. Uh, things out of this, recommendations that were going to be put forward, were going to be legally binding. Uh, under international law, which is pretty ephemeral, I've got to tell you. I don't know that there's um, any international policeman that comes around and arrests you for uh, uh, not um, for, for, for breaching international law. But regardless, nations sort of abide by it. Um, well, well, this was going to be legally binding on nations. You know, we could have had things such as quarantines, lockdowns, uh, isolations. Uh, vaccination mandates, mask mandates, uh, uh, country entry prohibitions, uh, contact tracing, all that sort of stuff that we saw during COVID. The worst of the worst that, that we're now all saying, you know, why did we do that? Um, you know, was there really a valid reason to do all of that? I mean, you now have uh, courts and, and other judicial outfits that are actually coming back on police and authorities saying there was a degree of heavy handedness here that was not justified. All of that is the kind of thing that could now be imposed not by your state government, not by your federal government, but by complete people completely removed from you in another country, sitting over there in Geneva, Switzerland, and making decisions that could impact upon uh, your nation, and your personal health choices. And Neil, you might ask the question, well, why on earth would the Australian government allow this? And um, indeed, if you look, the Australian government and the Department of Health have a little flyer that they did up, which was frequently asked questions uh, in response to this uh, pandemic treaty. And it's the first time I've seen a document like this about some international accord. Uh, but obviously there was concern about, uh, you know, people like me who are saying stuff out there that this this treaty is going to undermine freedom and it's going to undermine sovereignty. And, uh, you know, they're trying to push back against the idea that it would undermine sovereignty, saying, oh, no, 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 the Australian parliament and state parliaments and governments would still have the ability to uh, pass laws and any law would have be subject to them. Well, that is true. But if you read further in that same document, it also says that the pandemic treaty would impose legally binding obligations on Australia. So in other words, the parliament would be required to bring in laws that would do this kind of thing, that would give the WHO power. And in fact, we already have the establishment of the Australian Centre for Disease Control, Neil, which is going to be the conduit for most of this stuff, that uh, when the WHO says something, the Australian CDC uh, will tell people how high to jump. Uh, that's how it's going to work. So thankfully, we don't have that treaty. We did have the passage of some international health regulations. I can talk about that briefly. But, um, you know, the treaty is not dead, but it's it's defeated at this point in time. So that Australian Centre for Disease Control, that's a relatively new initiative too, isn't it, uh, for Australia? Yeah. Um, whereabouts are our leaders on this? Um, you had the Australian government uh, uh, over in Geneva actually on the side of let's sign this treaty. Is yeah. that where it was at? What about our opposition? Is, was the opposition in favour of that or were they actually opposing it? Well, you're spot on with the federal government's approach. Uh, the health minister, Mark Butler, as every other country was coming out, well, not every other country, but many other countries, including uh, some of our great allies like the United Kingdom are coming out saying there's no way we're going to pass this in its current form. The Australian government, in its wisdom, the federal health minister came out and 
declared Australia was completely signed up to it, you know, was going to vote for it and um, called on other countries to support it. And that was at its death knell. So that's how signed up the Australian government is to it. As for the opposition, look, uh, we don't know. Um, I suspect that uh, overall there may be um, maybe not support for it, but uh, nonetheless, it's not a high mind issue and uh, they might just go with the flow, but it remains to be seen because there are some senators there who who stood up uh, amongst the Liberal National Coalition and the crossbenchers who stood up and said that we should not pass this. And we're talking about people uh, of the... And there was a long list. There was 14 of them for, from memory, so I'm not going to remember all the names on it. Uh, but you had uh, the people who were the ringleaders of this uh, of of this list to oppose the pandemic treaty, like Senator Matt Canavan, Senator Rex Antic, uh, Senator Jared Rennick. Um, but then there were other people whose names are on the list that were fairly prominent people as well, such as Barnaby Joyce, former Deputy Prime Minister. So um, it may be that a coalition would reject signing up to this, but uh, it, that remains to be seen. What about people of faith, George, uh, the Christian, and thoughts of uh, some control mechanism that comes internationally about where a Christian might think of uh, national sovereignty and uh, the things that might impact uh, us by way of you know international legal mandates? Uh, is there mm. any sort of dimension here you can pick up on for uh, for our listeners? Well, there is a dimension. I mean, and look, there's a lot in this treaty that was a little bit amorphous. It was chopping and changing at all points. But at one stage there, the World Health Organization was talking about rolling in combating misinformation as part of this. Now, you think, how on earth is that a health issue? But, uh, of course, everything becomes a health issue if you can say that... Uh, uh, free speech or, you know, uh, what people might say using free speech uh, can somehow affect public health, uh, then you can you can enact measures to clamp down on it uh, if you don't believe in free speech. And, um, you know, uh, perhaps if we look at that, we could say that there are certain uh, uh, denominations within the Christian faith that uh, have specific beliefs regarding medical treatments um, and, uh, you know, what they say could be put forward as, um, as disinformation or misinformation and uh, thereby their ability to, to say it and advocate for those things could be silenced. I mean, that is quite possible quite possible under arrangements that uh, a treaty might have to clamp down on what uh, the authorities deem to be misinformation. Uh, let's talk about some of the regulations that they were discussing, George. Uh, international health regulations, what would that look like if uh, if Australia was signed up to this and said, uh, we'll just go along with it? Yeah, well, alongside what they call the pandemic treaty, there was a second tranche of uh, of, of changes that were proposed and they're called international health regulations. Uh, they're um, uh, the regulations that the World Health Organization has in place to deal with various different things. Uh, so a suite of changes that were proposed. And one thing that I did get wrong, and it was actually a big thing to get wrong, I'm sorry, Neil, before, is that um, the element about the declaration of pandemic emergencies uh, because this whole thing is quite complex and can be a little bit amorphous at times. Some things overlap. But uh, the key to that was in the international health regulations. Now, i got to say there's sort of good news, bad news, mixed news in this arena because they wanted to get something. They realised that the World Health Assembly uh, was going to be just an absolute defeat for the agenda around the pandemic treaty. And so there had to be something salvaged from it to, uh, I guess, have the World Health Organization be able to craft a good press release and and tell the world that um, they actually did something uh, rather than just have something rejected. So what they did is that they rammed through these international health regulations. Uh, one of those regulations was about uh, something I talked earlier that I said was part of the pandemic pandemic treaty. And, and that was uh, the declaration of public emergencies or public health emergencies uh, by the Director General of the World Health Organization. Um, now, that was passed, I gotta say. 
as part of the international health regulations. But it was done at the uh, at the last minute, and it was done under a cloud of confusion and also uh, a cloud of controversy in that there are experts saying that actually the passage of that was in breach of the World Health Assembly rules. Um, why? Well, there was only about a third of member states that were actually in the room at the time of the passage of that uh, of that international health regulation change. So there's some query around whether or not that that is going to have any effect whatsoever, and we'll you know, keep an eye out on that. But nonetheless, um, they're saying it was passed at this stage, and uh, the reality is Australia now has a year. Well, any any organisation or any member state of the World Health Organisation has the ability to opt out of the international health regulations in the next year. If they don't, if they say nothing, the amendments automatically take effect in due time, that is a year from now, and um, uh, you, you basically then have handed over the ability to declare a pandemic emergency in your own country to the World Health Organisation, to Geneva, to uh, uh, Dr Tedros, uh, who, who heads a thing. Uh, and that's something that I think is just a, a bridge too far. So, you know, there was bad that come out of it, but at, at those bad decisions are now, I guess, is a cloud of of uh, controversy over them, given that uh, we're not sure whether they're actually legally passed or not. Uh, but the reality is the Australian Parliament has, um, uh, up until a year from now, the ability to say no, we don't want those uh, international health regulations to actually be in effect. So Australia can opt out. Um, the current government position is they're basically opting in. Um, yes. And so when there is a new terminology, now, as you say, uh, these things that when they're brought in at the last minute and uh, passes the assembly, even though not everyone was there, uh, doubts over whether it's all legally binding, but... Uh, new terminology around a pandemic emergency. So change the terminology and then you can sort of reset where the agenda is at. Is there something sinister in all of this, do you think? Or is it just uh, the normal process of how you actually get to some sort of resolution? I think that they were desperate to get something positive out of this World Health Assembly. And so they went and did that, um, even though they know, knew or suspected that it would be breaching their own rules of the assembly. Uh, is there anything sinister in it? Uh, uh, look, I, I don't trust them, Neil. I don't trust uh, any of these globalist outfits. Why don't I trust them? Because there's not a skerrick of democracy involved in the entire thing. None of these people are elected. None of these people are accountable to the public, to uh, average citizens, uh, and therefore you've got to question everything when it comes from any of these globalist bodies, whether it be the United Nations, the World Health Organization, you know, even you know think tanks that are quite powerful like the World Economic Forum. They all sit over there in their uh, ivory towers in Geneva um, dictating laws and policies for the rest of us and... Um, there is just zero accountability uh, uh, about these organisations. Let me ask you about uh, the hat you wear with Citizen Go. And uh, we've mentioned that many a time and had you on before and talking about Citizen Go and you've been leading the Citizen Go operations here in Australia. Um, Citizen Go is likely to be leading a campaign uh, insofar as this comes over this next year, uh, is that going to be the place where people will be able to at least get some alternative insights into what's going on there? I mean, there's been some uh, very good individual researchers that have been uh, looking into the pandemic treaty over the past uh, year. I could name a few. James Raguski comes to mind. But uh, in terms of organisations, Citizen Go has been leading the charge on the pandemic treaty issue now for more than a year. Um, it has been there at every major uh, summit or, or meeting that they've had, um, protesting it as uh, and also lobbying um, those involved in the treaty, you know, against doing it. And so that's been happening for more than a year. And given that they've kicked the can down the road for another year, um, we will be there every step of the way 
uh, arguing against it and arguing against international health regulation changes from taking effect in uh, countries around the world, including Australia. Uh, so that'll be the direction that we are going in. Um, we see this uh, quite clearly as a threat to national sovereignty, but more importantly, as a threat to international health freedoms when you have um, the ability of a globalist body to declare things like vaccine mandates uh, for all Australians. Uh, it really is beyond the pale as far as I'm concerned and as far as Citizen Go is concerned because, again, these global globalist bodies are not democratically elected. Um, you can almost... Um, I mean, look, uh, 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 there's many arguments against doing it full stop, but at least you can mount an argument that if a government, a democratically elected government, imposes a mandate for something you can say, pardon the pun, that that government has a mandate to do that because it's elected by the people. Um, now, you know, I actually would disagree with that. I think that personal um, freedoms trump any sort of uh, uh, democratically elected mandate. But nonetheless, there is no democratic mandate for the World Health Organisation. Um, and for them to be imposing mandates and whatnot on the Australian public is just something that, uh, that this can't be tolerated as far as I'm concerned. We're taking calls on 1800 316 316. Let's take a call. Chris is in Melbourne. Hey, Chris, welcome along. Uh, good day, Neil and George. Yeah, I, I hope um, like George and Citizen Go are taking note of what's happening in America and the Philippines where uh, Fauci is being grilled by Marjorie Taylor Greene and, uh, you know, social distancing is being proved useless. Masks are being proved useless. In the Philippines, they're uh, showing that um, vaccine injuries to children are turning them into 60-year-olds. And um, in, in, in Portugal, the PCR test by four German holiday makers was proved to be so unreliable, 99% unreliable. Um, so these, you know, it looks like more like everybody thought uh, uh, AstraZeneca uh, is taking the vaccine off the market, but it was just a big pandemic by the elites to uh, you know, make money. Chris, uh, breaking up a little, and uh, we are on our way to news in just about a minute and a bit. A uh, quick response here from George, uh, picking up some things that Chris is sharing there. Yeah, I'm aware of what Chris is sharing, and uh, as is um, the Citizen Go organisation. Um, and it's interesting that a lot of these things you might, many listeners might be going, what, what's that all about? Well, well, in the US, they've been grilling Anthony Fauci, who was uh, a lot of the architect of a lot of the measures that other countries adopted. Uh, he's admitted that the uh, six metre rule was just something that was made up pretty much. Uh, he's admitted a lot of other things uh, there, and people would, might want to look at some other sources, other news sources to get information. And in the Philippines, uh, they are doing a major investigation in their uh, Congress at the moment into uh, the effects of these jabs on children. And uh, that's very interesting. It's eliciting some information that uh, may have the vaccine companies in hot water in the Philippines, at least anyway. Uh, George, take us back to uh, actually being on the ground in Geneva, the sorts of things that were, you know, bubbling along. Uh, you said there were protests and all sorts of things on the streets, which is quite unusual for European countries to be out on the streets and protesting on an issue, something like this. Uh, on the ground, what, what stands out as the sorts of things, the messages that were being delivered? Yeah, well, the protests on that Saturday were uh, unusual for uh, uh, Geneva. Uh, they do have small demonstrations, but um, that was uh, from from other colleagues that were there. They were who have been to Geneva before. They said this was something else. But what was also something else was uh, the bus that Citizen Go had travelling all throughout European cities that uh, ended up in uh, Geneva for the uh, World Health Assembly. Uh, now, <laughs> there would not have been a delegate who uh, was in attendance there in Geneva that would not have seen this bus, a big bright blue bus that had uh, written on the side of it, no to the pandemic treaty, stop the UN power grab. That was written on the front and the back and, and the sides and uh, everywhere. And it was basically circling around and around and around the, uh, the sort of square where the... Uh, uh, just outside the United Nations um, building, uh, the famous one you see with all the flags that uh, go down to the uh, the front entrance there. Um, and 
anyway, um, we were, uh, as in Citizen Go campaigners, were assembled there and, uh, uh, you know, with our signs and placards and, uh, and, 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 and banners and people were stopping and talking to us, taking photos. We had... Um, uh, one of the um, one of the major uh, conservative US um, uh, alternative media organisations, Turning Point America, actually they're uh, interviewing us. But then it started raining, so we took uh, shelter underneath a bus shelter, and um, and it was then that we spotted police lights flashing, and we saw our bus had been. Um, been cordoned off and, and and stopped in the middle of the road. So we run over, what's going on? Well, the police had stopped the bus because of a complaint that came from within the United Nations that a bus was circulating near the UN building that was spreading propaganda. Now, I didn't know that that was an offence that police uh, would uh, would stop you for spreading propaganda, but in Geneva, it's, it, it, it was. And, uh, you know, they proceeded to question, take photos, take photos, uh, details of names and passports and all the rest of it and, and then let us on our way when they saw that everything was in order. Um, but that didn't just happen one day. The second day when we went there to protest as well, once again, two police officers turned up uh, with complaints that emanated out of the United Nations that uh, we were somehow disrupting the peace by being there and um, even though that we had permits to be there, uh, you know, that were signed by the local authorities. Um, so, uh, and again, once again, the police took uh, names and details and passports and all the rest of it, uh, passport details. Um, so it just shows you that there's an element within the United Nations that does not like any idea of dissent, any idea of protest, any idea of opposition to their events, uh, to, to, to their policies and programs. Um, and in fact, uh, because uh, I've become hyper paranoid at that point in time, I uh, saw one guy taking photos of the bus after the police incident. And um, I thought, oh, this might be an innocent uh, bystander just uh, wanting to check it out. And I don't know why, but my uh, spidey senses went up and I sort of observed this guy for a while only to find out he had a UN lanyard on. And uh, when I saw the badge, it was a UN security badge. So they were out in force, you know, just upset that we were there protesting their agenda. Very weird, Neil. Very, very weird. Because an effective protest, uh, when it's a global issue that is being debated, uh, could have global consequences if that all gets out of control and uh, there's a viral, uh, you know, media coverage that goes around the world that uh, could detract from what the uh, UN was trying to achieve. Uh, let me ask you here, though, because, um, you know, when we talk about international treaties and covenants and such things, um, mm. sometimes we'll make a reference to uh, one of those called the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And Christians will say, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll draw on uh, those uh, elements in something like that to maintain our freedoms. Um the alternative here seems to be the opposite direction because uh, the alternative is against freedoms when you're talking about the sort of treaty uh, when, with a, a health uh, treaty here or a pandemic treaty. Any yeah. thoughts here on, on, on the value of these international covenants and treaties? Because sometimes we say they're good and, and in this, this occasion uh, arguing they're bad. I think that uh, a lot of the international covenants that came out with the establishment of the United Nations um, probably wouldn't see the light of day today um, because of the things contained within them that you said, the right of freedom of expression, the right of freedom of assembly. Uh, for instance, the things in that document, uh, sorry, not yeah, no, no, it would be that document and another document, the international uh, rights of, of children, uh, which talk about every child having the right to life. Uh, that uh, sort of language now uh, would be bitterly opposed by elements within the United, what controlling elements within the United Nations and the World Health Organization, uh, Neil. So I think that uh, that organization, as much as there might have been legitimate criticisms of where their agenda might go at the start, it certainly is now hell worse than crooked today. So I think that anything coming out of the UN 
World Health Organization and any other uh, globalist body like that probably needs to be uh, either thoroughly scrutinised and have all of the uh, the hairs removed from it or rejected these days because uh, there's not too much good that's coming out of that, those outfits. Well, we're taking calls. 1-800-316-316. You might like to have your say, a question, a comment, even a critique for our conversation. Let's take another call. Tim is in Red Bank Creek in Queensland. Hey, Tim, welcome. Thank you, mate. And g'day, George. Congratulations on your election to council, mate. Thank um, you very much. I think in regards to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I sort of went along with everything, got vaccinated. Like, all the media organisations seem to be pushing the same line and seem to pull the wool over our eyes. For me, my opinion changed uh, regarding the, the forced vaccination on the population when... Novak Djokovic wanted to come into the country. He'd actually had mm. coronavirus and recovered, so he would have had immunity, but there still seemed to be this just uh, draconian push to get him vaccinated. That's where I started to um, question what was going on. Um, in, in, in regards to what's happening with the globalist push uh, surrounding many policy areas of the government, I think uh, the, the referendum on the voice to parliament highlighted um, just that, 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 a, that the Australian population aren't as trusting as what the government uh, would have you believe. Um, there seemed to be a lot of... Um, that. Well, there was a failure to disclose what the voice is actually about, and I think um, the government uh, miscalculated how um, compliant the population is in Australia... Um, I'd like to think that people will have their eyes open to what's happening with this uh, World Health Organization um, agreement that's being pushed. Um, what What are your thoughts surrounding those issues, George? George, yeah, look, it's a very good point, actually. I mean, um, I think that what was just said there is spot on. That the uh, the powers that be in Canberra thought that um, the voice would sail through. Um, but when the Australian public were asked a question and started to do their research into that question, uh, and they realised that the answer was not good, they rejected it. And they rejected it um, of the likes you've never seen before, you know, 60, 40 against, and in uh, places like where I'm from, 80, 20 against. Um so I think that when a question is actually asked to the Australian people, and how often is that done in politics, right? Hardly ever, you know. Uh, we're just dictated to and we just have to lump it. But when we're actually asked something and we get to do our research and we get to listen to all points of view, um, we, uh, we're often pretty sceptical as a people. Uh, we're pretty sceptical. Um, and that's a good thing sometimes because... Uh, you know, you don't fall for whatever agenda is put in front of you. And uh, I think that something like this pandemic treaty, which is uh, in the international health regulations, which are going to be major changes to the way that we run our health services in Australia, that we make health decisions in Australia, that things like this should be put before the people. Uh, if something's coming from an unelected body that's thousands of kilometres away from us, uh, then there's got to be the imprimatur of democracy and sovereignty over it. So put it to the people. They never will do that. Um, but uh, I would say that the only way it would have legitimacy is if the people of Australia rubber stamped it and, uh, and they won't, which is why there'll never be an attempt to do that. Thanks so much to Tim in Red Bank for your insight. Uh, just to touch on this for a moment, um, an Australian strength uh, that we don't roll over easily, although our reputation mm. internationally took a big hit, didn't it, during the pandemic when it looked like Australia had rolled over very easily under the mandates. Uh, but as you say, when we are asked, we are often sceptical. Um, 
but how do we get asked a little more here? I mean, I guess, you know, talk back radio is one way that people have a, a voice uh, that's not always straight into the corridors of power. But uh, what are your thoughts here, George? Uh, how do you speak up and, and make your voice known? Is there some sort of mechanism, you know, some citizens' assemblies and things like that, that we ought to be asked more about the issues that are confronting the nation? Oh, look, 100%. And, like, you know, with... Um uh, you know, with every hat that I have, whether it be, you know, citizen go or council or whatever, personally, my view is I've always been in favour of uh, the kind of democracy that they call direct democracy, where on substantial matters that the populace are asked via a referendum or plebiscite. Um, and and you can even go so far with that where the populace can actually come up with initiatives uh uh, citizens initiated referenda or initiative referendums where the citizens actually propose laws and um, they can then be voted on and and passed and um, you know that can go either way we've seen tax cuts in the US because of that and states that have it and we've also seen uh, marijuana fully legalized in other states so there's swings and roundabouts depending on your point of view um, you know but uh, uh, ultimately that is a uh, I think a purer form of, of democracy than just simply representative democracy, which um, has become a little bit polluted uh, by the fact that political parties, particularly in Australia now have such rigid control over our representatives. And, um, and often those political parties are uh, also have um, globalist influences uh, put upon them as well. So, um, yeah, look, I'm a big supporter of of, um, of direct democracy, Neil, but that's um, probably a, a tale for another time. <laughs> it will be. <laughs> hey, let's take another call. Our talkback line's open on 1800 316 316. Let's hear from, I think it's Lambos in Hobart in Tassie. Hello, Lambos, is it? Is that the way I pronounce your name? Yeah, that's correct. How Good, are you, buddy? Good, Lambos. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, I'd just like to uh, congratulate George on his trip to Jabina, uh, and I want to uh, actually just uh, give him support that he's... Uh, there's a lot of people supporting him in his uh, direction because there's a lot of people that aren't speaking up, I feel, that, uh, that uh, are, are cornered and feel that they're powerless because it's only me or it's only one person. Um, I personally think, without getting too deep into it, uh, I think our politicians across the country, as well as Hobart, have lost the plot. And if they've been voted in to do a particular job, and then they're passing on their responsibilities to another person or another uh, entity, that, why are we why are we voting them in in the first place? If they're only passing on their their commitment and their job, they're obviously not. Uh, capable of doing the job, step down, let someone else do it. Good point, Lambos. Let's get a thought or two here from George, because if we elect politicians to represent us, uh, they've handballed their responsibility to an international treaty. Uh, that doesn't sound like the sort of democracy that uh, we might think is effective if we're e electing representatives. Uh, thoughts here, George, for Lambos? He's 100% correct. I mean, and you can see it across many issues, this uh, pandemic treaty, but even uh, let's talk about something that I was uh, been campaigning about for a long time and Citizen Go have been campaigning about the digital ID bill. I mean, uh, I've said it once, I've said it a million times, Neil, that no one in Australia has woke up in a sweat in the morning thinking oh goodness I don't have a digital ID you know no one stopped their politician in the street phoned them emailed them uh, you know uh, uh, had a meeting with them saying we wanted we want a digital ID or I want a digital ID so where has it come from it's come from overseas it's come from international or globalist uh, bodies that have been pushing this agenda such as the United Nations and the World Economic Forum uh, and it's wormed its way into uh, the circle that is Australian democracy. It hasn't come from Australian democracy. It's been imposed from the top down. And basically then you're, uh, you've almost let out, you've almost contracted out uh, your policy development process to an unelected, unrepresentative globalist elite, and you're now bringing that in and imposing it on the Australian public. That is not 
how representative democracy is supposed to work. Um, you know, laws are supposed to be from the ground up in representative democracy, not from the top down. But that's more and more what we're seeing at this st at this stage. And I got to say, Neil, my, my my fear is that that's a return to neo feudalism. That's not uh, represent representative democracy in the slightest. Lambos in Hobart, thank you so much for your call and just a few minutes remaining for our conversation. A return to neo-feudalism, uh, the thought that if everyone on all sides of Parliament acknowledges God and that there are some laws that never change, uh, then you've got something to work with by way of making the best harmonious civilised uh, organisational uh, nation. But when you m remove God from the mix, you've got uh, the idea of control being uh, up to every individual and every group that wants to uh, combat and, and be a part of the process. So if we're bringing back to a f something of a faith issue here, uh, there is something important and special about the kingdom of God, that God is king, that uh, that our consciences are free because uh, our consciences are free before God. Uh, any thoughts here around the things that, that we might have been seeing, a slippery slope and such things? Well, uh, Neil, I, I hear your your argument. It's very well articulated. That's why you do so well in this uh, uh public square you know when you're bringing uh, uh trying to shine a christian light on issues in the public square and um look at the one thing that i think um we've got to worry about is um function creep uh, as christians now you might not think there's an issue to do with uh pandemics you might not think that there's a christian issue here and perhaps um there isn't you know uh, that might be up for debate uh, but I would, uh, would hasten to think that there's not a Christian issue with the life question. Now, look, the, the uh, World Health Organization has just tried to give itself the ability to declare not just pandemic emergencies, but public health emergencies worldwide. So uh, what else does the World Health Organization subscribe to? Well, I can tell you that they are completely and utterly subscribed to the proliferation of abortion globally. Uh, they believe that that is key for women's health, uh, gender equality and health, and all the rest of the, the buzzwords and jargon that you hear ascribed to the killing of unborn babies now. And um, uh, what's going to happen... I mean, I don't know. I don't think they will have any power at the moment, but function creep, eventually it could be pushed further into other areas and maybe eventually the World Health Organization might get power in terms of this area to declare um, women's health a public health emergency and uh, so that all countries now have to have abortion on demand right up until birth. I mean, in Australia, we pretty much already have it, so it would mean no change here, but uh, countries throughout Africa and the Philippines where democratically elected governments have said no to that agenda, uh, which is essentially uh, bringing about the culture of death on their society, that they will be usurped. Um, and uh, I'm going to say that um, as a result, God's innocent children will be destroyed. And that quite clearly would be a Christian issue. So that's where centralization of power becomes a very, very dangerous thing. And I think that we've got to recognize as Christians that it is a dangerous thing. So uh, a resistance to globalization uh, when it comes to health issues, uh, various mandates that could be imposed uh, legally on nations that signed up to uh, these sorts of things that we're discussing today about a, a, a pandemic treaty. And uh, I guess it is good news. It has been delayed, but there's likely to be another vote next year. Uh, so no doubt we'll be talking about that in the lead up to it and uh, noting where Australian politicians and uh, government and opposition might be sitting uh, uh, according to that. I did mention a little earlier Citizen Go. And Citizen Go, it's not just something that's a local organisation. 
Uh, you've been wearing your Citizen Go cap, uh, George, but Citizen Go is in the US. And uh, what, are, what other nations around the world are there, bases for Citizen Go and uh, all of this uh, information? You might even call it intelligence being gleaned and shared so yes. that people can have a Christian foundation for their thinking. Uh, thoughts here? How far is it uh, uh, proliferated yeah, around com- the world? It's come out of Spain. It's right across Europe, the UK, the Americas, Latin America, and uh, now Australia is spreading into Asia. So it's an it's a international movement, uh, which is all about defending and promoting life, family, and freedom. Uh, so uh, if people want more information on it, they can go to citizengo.org and uh, become a member of that movement. And it is good for us to be able to connect with those organisations that are dealing with things here in Australia and uh, to have connection to Citizen Go, which has this global uh, focus too on what is developing around the world. There is a website, you can check on that, citizengo.org. Citizengo.org, they use often online petitions, action alerts as a resource to defend and promote life, family and liberty. CitizenGo.org and George Christensen has been Campaigns Director for Citizen Go here in Australia. Uh, he's also recently elected Councillor of the Mackay Regional Council. Just quickly, George, uh, just a few seconds here, but uh, how's all that going? You're uh, you're back in the back in council in Mackay. Yes, and we get in trouble now if we say that we're speaking on behalf of, or if we don't say that we're not speaking on behalf of Mackay Regional Council. So I've got to say that first before I mention anything to do with that. I'm not speaking on behalf of Mackay Regional Council, but I can tell you it's a different world when I was a local government councillor 20 years ago. Uh, there are a lot more rules in place about what councillors can and can't do, but uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to uh, try and get stuff done for your local community, but it's a challenge that I'm uh, happily taking on for the next uh, four years and that I'm uh, uh, yeah, sinking my teeth into anyway now. Well, George, we'll look forward to another update and uh, probably not on Mackay Regional Council issues, but uh, probably <laughs> on some of these bigger international globalist agenda type issues that we know you like to follow and always appreciate the fact that you can bring a, a Christian dimension to that too and a lot of listeners will be surprised to know that you have a degree in theology uh, to be able to bring those dimensions to the fore as well. George, thanks so much for sharing these thoughts with us today on 2020. Thank you very much, Neil. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.